Hi, it's Richard Dwyer. RichardDwyer.com, keeping it free. Blogspot.com. As many of you know, following the Dwyer Crime Channel here on YouTube, I'm a lawyer in Northern California, civil litigator, family lawyer, not a criminal lawyer. And from time to time, I look at cases in the news. Now understand, the goal here is to find the truth. And many times here online in looking at a crime, I'll reach the conclusion that the person who was convicted of the crime was wrongly convicted. Conversely, other times when looking at some famous crimes, I'll reach the conclusion that the person was properly convicted. Understand, the goal here is simply to get at the truth. Right? That's my agenda. We'll let the cards fall where they may. Right? Now, let me add that today I'm doing daddy duty. Right off camera here is my six-month-old daughter. So from time to time, you might hear baby noises. That's not your computer speaker. That's actually a live baby here just off camera. Right? But I wanted to get this video out. Now, let me point out, my partner disagrees with me on this case. You should be aware of that. She's watching The Making of a Murderer on Netflix. We've both watched it together and she feels, quite frankly, that Stephen Avery has been railroaded. Right? That the police investigation was slanted. That his nephew didn't have an attorney present when he gave a coerced confession in her mind. Right? Now, let me just tell you where I stand. Obviously, there's no doubt that the crime for which he was exonerated, right, the crime for which he was initially imprisoned, that rape case, he's innocent of that crime, right? DNA matched another man. Okay, fair enough. But let me ask a real basic question. If a sociopath gets wrongly convicted of a crime, right? Does that mean the person isn't a sociopath and isn't capable of committing another crime? In looking at the evidence for the Teresa Hallback murder, to me it's clear that Stephen Avery did the crime. Right? In my opinion, he's guilty, he's where he belongs, and that's in prison. Now let me say, let's separate out whatever the cops did. Let's separate out the first conviction from this crime. Right? In the series, they spend a lot of time telling you that he was railroaded. Right? They want to set up some scenario where he sues the state and of course this second crime is supposed to have been a frame-up job where the state is supposed to have tried to get back at him for suing them over a wrongful conviction but understand that narrative falls apart by the way it falls apart on camera people need to realize that nancy grace of headline news actually spoke with Stephen Avery 10 years ago. And Stephen Avery admitted in the interview on film that the afternoon that Teresa Hallback went missing, she actually showed up at his house. Folks, that's on film. Now understand, this lie is so out there that it's inconsistent with Avery's own phone records, right? Avery admits that she showed up, but yet the day of the crime, the afternoon of the crime, Avery calls her phone around 4.30 that afternoon and says, hey, I'm here. Why haven't you shown up? Right, you can't reconcile the two. Even my kid's getting upset here. You can't reconcile the two. Either she showed up at his house that afternoon or she didn't. If she showed up as he himself admitted to Nancy Grace, 
then why is he making the later call to try to throw cops off the scent, to try to mislead people into believing that she didn't show up at his house? Understand, there's a cover-up here, and the cover-up involves Stephen Avery. Let me say, perhaps the most damning piece of evidence, right? You know, her bones are found in his burn pit. But the most damning piece of evidence is the fact that, understand, it's not one or two bones in his burn pit. In other words, cops didn't come and say, hey, here's that SOB who's suing us. Let's frame him. Jerry, do you have a bone from that murder victim? Let's go toss it in his burn pit. Then let's claim that he's the one who did the killing. Right? That's not this case, folks. Understand, almost all of her bones, almost all of them, are found in Avery's burn pit. Almost all of them. Right, if the cops were going to frame him, they would literally have to bring her entire skeleton to his burn pit. Think about it. That doesn't make sense. That's not plausible. Let's go one step further, too. Understand that her bones in his burn pit are intertwined with the tires that were in his pit. In other words, the burning of the bones took place in his burn pit. This isn't even a plant job where the cops are supposed to have brought a skeleton over and dumped it in the burn pit. No, here, we're supposed to believe that the cops bring a corpse over and burn the corpse in Stephen Avery's burn pit. Folks, that's that's just not plausible. Let's go one step further. Understand the evidence. Right? He's out of prison for two years. Understand the forensic evidence. Did you know that his blood is in six places? Six in her vehicle right her DNA I know on the series they're saying hey the cops didn't find any any bullets for a long time understand her DNA is on a bullet fragment from his gun in his garage think about that think about the level of a frame-up that would have to happen here the cops wouldn't be able to just dip any bullet in her blood. They would have to fire a bullet from his gun, which is in his garage, and then put her blood on it. Right? So, you know, let's talk about his nephew. Right? Just know that Avery's statements publicly are inconsistent. The burn pit shows that the victim was burned in that pit. The number of bones are practically every bone in the human body. Right? This is not cops going someplace, dropping one bone and saying, hey, look, we found a murderer. No, this is different. Well, let's talk about his nephew, Brandon Dassey. Now, I know on the series, they have you believe that he's interviewed without his attorney present. Did you know the attorney's investigator was actually in the room? Understand, the cops didn't just grab this guy and say, hey, come talk with us. No, this is an arranged meeting where the attorney knew about it ahead of time. Sent his investigator there. Now, I know on the series they make it look like the guy is spoon-fed the facts, right? He's like, hey, what's this about? They say, hey, say that you were over at Avery's house killing this woman, right? That's not the way it went at all. Understand, Dassey actually talks for a while 
give some facts that aren't suggested to him. Now, now let me say this. On the show, they say, look, if she was murdered at Avery's, why isn't there blood everywhere? Right? Understand that Dassey had bleach on him. Think about that. Right? 16-year-old, how many of us are walking around and, oh, by chance, the day a woman goes missing, we somehow get bleach on our clothes. Well, understand, here's what Dassey said during part of his confession. Right? He went to go pick up some stuff around the yard then. After that, we, he, asked me to come in the house because he wanted to show me something. And he showed me that she was laying on the bed. Her hands were roped up to the bed and that her legs were cuffed. And then he told me to have sex with her, and so I did. Because I thought I was not going to get away from him, because he was too strong. So I did what he said, and then after that he untied her and uncuffed her, and then he brought her outside, and before he went outside, he told me to grab her clothes and her shoes. So we went into the garage, and before she went out, when she... Uh, when, before he took her outside, he had tied up her hands and feet and then was in the garage and he stabbed her and then told me to. Right? That's part of Dassey's confession. He goes further. And when we put her in the fire and her clothes, we were standing right by the garage to wait for it to get down, so we threw some of that stuff on it after it went down. Right? Folks, don't be fooled by editing. Don't be fooled by a slickly produced documentary that leaves out relevant portions of Nephew Dassey's confession. Right? Don't be fooled by a documentary that doesn't tell you that Avery has made inconsistent statements that are material to the investigation. Right? He admits she came over that day. Then he's calling her and saying, hey, where are you? How come you haven't come over? Right? Don't be fooled when they try to make it sound like bones were planted in a burn pit where it's clear that the bones are interwoven with tire parts that were already in the burn pit. Right? Stephen Avery, quite frankly, in my opinion, is guilty. Right? This case isn't a close call. In my opinion, it's overwhelming. Understand the victim didn't want to go back over to Avery's because Avery earlier had answered the door wearing a towel. Right? So did you know that Avery then tries to call her without revealing that it's him? He calls her twice that day, according to phone records, using star 67. Why would he do that? Why do you have to make secret calls to have an auto trader photographer take photos of a car on your property? Right? I'm going to get back to my child just to understand, as upset as she is, I'm that upset by this attempt to make Avery look innocent. Anyway, that's how I see it. Let me hear from you. Leave your comments in the comment section to this video, including any discussion of any part of the evidence that you've uncovered. Thanks for stopping by.